Okay. Hey guys, welcome back to the David Mathis podcast. I'm your host, David Mathis, of course. I am back with another uh, episode and I've got a great guest today, Dasha. Um, Dasha, why don't you go ahead and tell people a little bit about yourself? Obviously, you are a registered dietitian. Um, you are also a coach, but uh, what else do you want people to know about you? Well, thank you for the introduction. My name is Dasha. Um, I, let's see, let, I got my first degree in biology and undergraduate at UMass Amherst. Then I went to Tufts University and I got my master's in nutritional epidemiology. So my background is very heavy in research. Um, from there, I went to the VA here down in Tampa to complete my dietetic internship where I became a registered dietitian shortly thereafter. Um, and now here I am. Um, to give you a little bit more background about my research, I now have four publications under my name. Um, the first, I would say, was when I was quite young, actually, um, working fairly irrelevant to the topic that's, that I am interested in now. But um, my master's thesis at Tufts was in the paleo diet and um, kind of the history and methodologies of what was used to actually create the paleo diet um, based off of Easton and uh, uh, Connor that created it. Um, and then thereafter, I, at the VA, I did a, another publication about um, predicting, oops, someone's trying to call me. Okay, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, about predicting um, malnutrition. So I studied uh, cirrhosis patients, uh, people with cirrhosis, and um, tried to predict if um, nutritionally speaking, if you've never, probably most people don't know, but registered dietitians, what we do um, when we first see a patient in the hospital, you're supposed to do what's called a nutrition screen um, on them, a nutrition assessment as well. Um, so the that would include a lot of palpitations and like feelings of uh, malnutrition, including like the acetyl lining and um, looking just at the fat pads around the around the eyes and on the uh, shoulder blades and a lot of things that, yeah, a lot of things that people don't know, but all these things um, we took into account and tried to predict which one would predict um, the progression of the disease the fastest, right? And there's a lot of different things we use as well, like grip strength and everything like that. And what I found, what we found and what the majority of the research is now saying, which is no surprise to the bodybuilding community, but um, loss of muscle is actually the biggest predictor of the progression of disease. So um, even if you are losing weight or gaining weight, it doesn't really matter um, because what is going to matter the most is the um, loss of muscle mass. So a lot of times, for example, people who have chronic diseases become depressed. And even though they're overweight, they might not actually be gaining any muscle strength. They might still be losing muscle strength, but their BMI might be quote unquote healthy, right? So there's kind of that paradox where um, their BMI is saying that they're not progressing in the disease, but in reality, we're losing a lot of muscles and the disease is progressing. So thought that might be interesting to some of your audience, but that was very big of a tangent. Um, so yeah, I do the paleo diet basically now. And um, um, that was my research, but I do not follow the paleo diet now. Um, what I do do now is my coaching platform, which is Core Perform. And that is a 12 week kind of um, starts with an elimination diet to basically create the most diverse diet as possible. So what we do is we start with this elimination diet that I created. Um, I basically took all the diets like low FODMAP, low GERD, low histamine, low what everything. And I tried to make the most uh, least reactive foods as possible for the most amount of people. And then I put it into a really easy to follow green, yellow, red light system. So um, it's super easy to follow. Like you just say like whatever for the first couple of weeks and then you gradually build out the diet from there. Okay. There's a lot of food that is included on that diet, but because a lot of um, people are so stuck in their routine as to what they can and can't have. It's very difficult to have any sort of dietary adjustments. Um, but I also tried to make sure that we are fortifying you with micronutrients during that time. So the rows are by green, yellow, red, um, but the column, um, the columns will go through in terms of micronutrients. So I took out all the micronutrients responsible for fat metabolism, um, 
carb metabolism for liver detoxification pathways. And I made sure that you have daily minimums to hit. So you have to hit two of these sulfur containing veggies or calcium containing veggies or colorful veggies for polyphenols. Um, and by doing that, we're actually really pushing a lot of that inflammation gone out of the system really, really quickly. So that's why you see, probably you've seen on my page, like a lot of people lose from like two pounds to 10 pounds in the first week. And it's just straight water loss. Like I cannot tell you, like I have people who track their macros and go on it. And after um, doing a few weeks on it, they have to bump up their calories two or two to 500 calories I've seen um, just because their bodies are more efficient at using the foods and thus they have more energy, probably their neat increases too. Yeah, that's, so guys, if you can't tell, the reason why I brought Dash on here is because she knows a lot about inflammation, gut health. Um, and I thought that that would be a really, really interesting topic to dive into because um, it's not my area of expertise. I know a little bit, but um, I definitely want to pick your brain because a lot of people, I mean, I know you obviously get them. I get people that come to me too. They have a lot of, a lot of digestion issues, right? And, and that could be what's holding them back for a lot of things, but it also could be causing diseases and other things that are, are occurring in our body. Um, one of the big things that we hear are artificial sugars, right? And how that kind of messes with the gut. What can you tell us about how that might or might not contribute to inflammation and, and some things that we can do to overcome that? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so we have no data to support that the long-term use of this is going to be detrimental, whatever, yada, yada. What I will say is we do have um, a data to support that it does disrupt the microbiome, right? Um, and does in fact um, cause some sort of dysbiosis or is associated with dysbiosis. Let's put it that way, because cause is very stringent term to be using in research, but it is associated with dysbiosis. Now with that said, um, I can say that almost everything you put in your mouth will change your microbiome, right? That is just the nature of how bacteria are fed, whether it be broccoli or rice, that will both, both of those will feed and nurture a different colony of bacteria, right? We, we know that um, whether you're eating protein or um, high fat, each of those will be feeding different bacterial strains. So even before we even go into artificial things, we know that no matter what we eat, something's going to change. Right. Now, whether that change is good or bad, um, we don't really know. What I will say is that I don't believe that artificial sugars are good. So yes, I would eliminate them from the diet if possible completely um, and use them only in moderation when necessary. Um, that is why also I'm coming out um, with my own line of supplements soon in the near future, hopefully for the gut health population who is more um, intolerant and more susceptible to those changes who might not be as, um, as tolerant to the artificial sweeteners and they might be more reactive when they do consume them. What, um, do you have a name for your supplement company yet? Supplement line? They're, gonna all, oh, they're all gonna be in corporate perform, yeah. It makes it easy, just keep it all under the same umbrella. That's so exciting. Yeah, yep. Now, one thing that um, I'm actually like my wife and I are dealing with right now because she's 27 weeks pregnant, um, but she also has a history of um, before I, I met her, she had lost a bunch of weight and then had gastric bypass. So like her, her, her gut is kind of a, a roller coaster. Oh, it's very small, <laughs> very small. Um, and, you know, one of the big things that we were having issues with um, when we first found out that she's pregnant is how is she going to get enough nutrients, right? To obviously not only grow a baby, but to make sure that she has enough extra. And, um, you know, one of the things that we were told was to look into uh, probiotics for her. Then I was also heard, then I also was told, no, probiotics are, you want to stay away from them. You want to more look towards prebiotics. What, what can you tell us about the difference between prebiotics and probiotics? If there's anything that we need to know, I, it seems like a very confusing topic to a lot of people. Well, first of all, I want to back up a little bit and they didn't even talk to her about liquid nutrition, liquid multivitamins. Well, she's taking, a she has, she has taken a multivitamin. Yeah. Is but it a liquid form? 
no, no. She takes a bunch of different uh, pills and stuff. Okay, that's the first thing I would recommend. Okay, is that people yeah. with should have talked about surgery about weeks ago, but that's okay. yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So if you have any sort of like um, bypass or any sort of gastric surgery, I always so one of the things that you're probably most susceptible to is B12 deficiency. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good. We're on the same page, at least starting to. Yeah. Yep. So B12. And then I believe iron is probably going to be another one. Um, but the best thing to begin anyone who has gotten that done is on liquid, um, liquid multivitamins. And that is because it's more readily absorbed. Um, and so pill form again, harder to digest on the system, harder to break down. You're actually absorbing less of the nutrients than if you were to actually take it liquid, um, and liquid would be able to permeate through a little bit better. Um, so that definitely makes yeah, sense. So, yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. And hopefully you can start her on that. Um, soon there's a few brands. Um, I believe it's called like liquid Mary's on, um, Amazon. You can look into that. And, and if anyone is struggling with their getting in enough, um, micronutrients, um, I would consider looking into that, but of course, discuss it with your doctor, because there are those specific, um, for that specific brand is for gastric bypass, I believe specifically. So a lot of the nutrients that it's super fortified with are the ones that she would be most uh, susceptible to depletion in. Um, now let's go back to prebiotics and probiotics. Yeah. So no, I appreciate um, prebiotics. the sidebar. Thank you so much. Yeah, That's absolutely. I, once it, once you told me that they started on probiotics, I was like, hold up. <laughs> we <laughs> haven't even gotten to like the regular stuff. Like, so I'm glad that we got to touch upon that, but um, yeah. So as you can see, I rarely start with prebiotics or probiotics when I when I assess someone. So um, that's all, always a red flag for me. Um, probiotics usually and prebiotics. Let me ask you something real quick. Do you usually have like your clients go get blood work done beforehand? Not necessarily. No. Uh -huh. Yeah, not necessarily. Most of the time I want to see what's going on first. And I can, and I can basically see that when they see their daily journals and their check-ins and their symptoms, um, because it doesn't make sense for me to say, go get blood work done versus I don't care about your blood work right now. I can tell that it's not hormonal. It has nothing to do with anything like this. It strictly is a, a gut thing. And I would rather spend that money on like a GI map for me to get some, some sort of testing or for someone else who I'm like, you know what, your gut seems fine, but your hormones are off the charts wacky. Like, let me get you in with a Dutch. Right. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, when it comes to prebiotics and probiotics, so probiotics, first of all, super strain specific needs to be specifically for the person. Again, I use this as like the very end of the therapies that we go through together, because that's when you want to be fortifying and healing that gut lining. Um, now, when it comes to prebiotics, you think of foods like onion, garlic, leek, apples, um, things like that. Those are the foods that feed and, and give fuel to the probiotics so that they can grow. The probiotics you then eat with, let's say the kombuchas or the sauerkrauts or the yogurt, um, kefir, um, those ones are the ones that will you want to consume with the prebiotics so that they can feed off of them. Um, when it comes to prebiotics, one of the hacks that I like to give is with resistant starches. So um, if you ever cook um, like sweet potatoes or any starch, rice, anything like that, and you cool it, that's the best time to consume it with a probiotic because after um, you cook the starch, um, it basically comes apart. And then when you cool it back again, it um, gelatinizes into a resistant starch. And those resistant starches are then the ones that fuel the probiotics to feed on so that you can create those short chain fatty acids, the butyrates in the gut. It's a hack. It is not going to change your life. It is not going to make any difference in your life. But if you want to nerd out and be like, hee hee, I, I made my special like gut meal, then you can do that. And um, I like to say the belly bowls with my clients. Um, the it's really, really easy to digest. And even when I'm nauseous and when I don't want to eat anything, I can always get down a belly bowl. Basically what it is, is um, either um, cooled sweet potato or cooled butternut squash or something cooled. Um, and then um, a dairy-free or dairy containing um, yogurt. So it has those 
probiotics on it as well, nuts and seeds, fresh berries and fruit. Um, and all of it together is like super sweet, super delicious, um, and really easy on the digestive system from, for my clients, at least. Um, I will say that like, whenever I say that to a lot of the bodybuilding community, they're automatically like, what are you talking about? Potatoes bloat the crap out of me. Um, like nuts and seeds are super hard to digest, like blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, yes, I understand, but we pick and choose our battles sometimes. And it's not necessarily optimal digestion, like quickest digestion, like rice would be, but it is very nutrient dense and provides a lot of the pre and probiotics. You know, I used to think that I was strange and I've even had people tell me that it was weird, but I actually prefer like cold sweet potatoes over like a hot yeah. sweet potato. Like I would, I would, yeah. I used to pre-cook them and then I would like put them in aluminum foil and put it in the refrigerator. And then I'd have them over the next few days and I would never reheat them up. I just liked mm -hmm. the taste of that cold sweet potato with a little bit of barbecue yeah. sauce or something, you know, but. And you want to know why? I'm glad to know that I'm like, on the right track. I'm not as weird as I may be, or some other people thought I was. So that's excellent. No, the reason why it actually tastes better. And I do the same exact thing. I like both, like I, you, if I'm lazy and I don't have time to prep it the night before, um, or let it cool down and then I'll eat it hot. But usually I like it cold. And the reason being is for the taste. It has nothing to do with the hack is because the, um, cooking like caramelizes the sugar. So it, creates more of a caramel taste when you cool it. Um, and that's why we both probably prefer the taste of it is it's a little bit sweeter and a little bit different on the, um, on the palate. Yeah. All right. I, I like the valid validation with that. That's great. Yeah, um, one thing we hear a lot of people say, or at least I have is, uh, when you eat things like fruits and, and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that, eat them with the skin on, right? Like apples and stuff like that. Right. Is there any, gut health benefits to that or, or no, like when it comes to, I guess what I'm trying to say is when it comes to fruits like that, or with vegetables is eating it raw better than steamed or what, what do we need to know about that? Okay. So let's start with fruit first, because, um, what I'm hearing from the reason why you're saying that it's better to eat it with the skin on for like apples and like all the things is because it has all the uh, phytonutrients and the antioxidants and a lot of them at least, and the fiber is in the skin, right? So they're promoting to eat that because it's very nutrient dense. It's funny because in my population, I always say skin them. Um, the reason being because of that fiber, it's harder to digest, right? So it might be harder to, to digest those foods for a lot of people. Um, or, but in general, um, you want to peel or cook in order for it to make it more digestible. The reason being is because you're eliminating and breaking down those fibers and allowing that uh, to be already broken down before it's even in the system a little bit more. So that's the added benefits of cooking um, and steaming. Um, you never want to boil your vegetables or uh, fruits because boiling um, will basically decrease the nutritional content. Well, is it a severe content? No, like you can still boil your veggies and your fruits. I don't mind. Um, it's better than no veggies and fruits, right? Exactly. So um, in terms of the optimal amount, um, definitely steaming would be best or slow cooking is even better. Um, now, the other thing that you had mentioned is raw vegetables. So raw vegetables are a huge no-no, huge no-no. Okay. Um, I don't know about you guys, but have you ever been able to eat a head of broccoli or a bag of raw carrots and not feel awful after? You know what? Um, I, I snack on raw carrots a lot. Like I'll have like carrots and hummus and everything and it, it doesn't do anything to me, but okay. like- I, I can definitely see what you're saying with the broccoli and things like that. Like after enough of it. Yeah. Like, you know, some people will take like raw broccoli and put it in like ranch or something like a dip like that. Right. Yeah. After a little bit of that. Yeah. I can start kind of feeling it and everything, but, um, so you're saying stay away from that if you can. 
try to at least like see him. Try it. Again, I'm not saying at all, like, do I think that people who can tolerate it shouldn't eat it? Absolutely. If that feels good for you, then eat it for sure. The only thing that's bad for us is the food that our bodies disagree with. So if that's disagreeing with you, then totally don't eat it. Obviously, right? Your body is rejecting it. It's yeah. telling you that it can't digest it. So um, if you can tolerate it, great. But I, I personally see in my practice, at least that um, raw, like baby carrots cause bloat, um, as well as like raw veggies in general. Um, the big one is salads, because um, although salads are great for us, they notoriously, we have a tendency to swallow a lot of air when we do eat salads. So, and we oftentimes don't chew it down well enough. So a lot of times people will like eat the salad and they'll be like, oh, I'm bloated after. It's like, cause you swallowed a ton of air and you probably didn't chew down that leaf very well. Right. right. Um, you kind of just swallow it. It's like volume. Right. Yeah. So I see um, those are chewing gum with people like they get really bloated. And, and I don't know if that's necessarily, is that, is that from like the sugar alcohols or is that from the air that you're, cause a lot of people like chomp on it, right? Like they suck down a lot of air with it. Yeah. So I'll tell you my theory. Now this has nothing to do with science. Please don't quote me on this. This is personal experience only, but um, I personally have celiac disease. So I am like hypersensitive to a lot of the additives that they put in there. And I swear to God, Trident has some sort of additive in it that every single time I have it, I will get extreme brain fog. Like I will just like really, like it's really hard on my system. Um, I don't think it is the sugar alcohols that they use because it's not even a sugar alcohol. I think they use like sucralose or something, which I can tolerate fine in other capacities. I really think it's the additives that they put in there. Um, so with gums, it's even like more different and, and, and something else to look into. Um, but for me, that's what causes my, at least like upset. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So there, there's two questions I want to get to, and I was going to do the first, I was going to do the second one first, but I'm going to kind of switch this around a little bit. Um, when it comes down to like food intolerances, right? What do you usually see? Do you usually see a certain type of food being more um, prob troublesome in people like across the board? Or I know, I know everything with nutrition is very individually based, right? But is there something that you just through your expertise, you working with a lot of people that you see like this is really occurring in a lot of people when they eat this, this is occurring? You know, um, I want to say no, and I want to say yes, right? So I'll tell you what I do, what I do see. So okay. when it comes to gluten, yes, most, a lot of people are, end up being a little bit more sensitive to that. And the only reason I say that is because a lot of the people who come to me also have an autoimmune condition. And those people specifically are more susceptible to having that um, increased uh, gut perme permeability um, that may cause the zonulin to open up that even further and cause some uncomfortable symptoms. But with that said, um, I have probably just as many people who are weirdly like, not weirdly actually, like are sensitive to like almonds or they can, and it's really bizarre too, like they can do almonds, but they can't do almond butter or they can do like almond butter will is straight like diarrhea, but almonds, whole almonds, totally fine. No gastric distress. Um, I also have a lot of people with nuts and seeds in general, just because of like the ulcerative colitis population and the IBD population um, and psoriasis too, where they're just like very prone to anything that's uh, really irritating the gut lining um, even a little bit. Um, but in terms of, oh, I know one, Xanthan gum. I cannot tell you how angry I am at the fitness community. Guys, your protein smoothies, your whatever smoothies, it has Xanthan gum in it. All those crappy supplements that you take. I don't wanna call out any supplement companies, but there is a company on the market right now that is very, very popular. And um, 
I have time and time and again had people come to me using their products. And as soon as they stopped using their products, their guts felt better. Um, and I know because I've looked on the internet that this company also pays off California fines um, for going above and beyond legal toxicity limits for heavy metals um, for the state of California, which I know is pretty weird in general. Like they're pretty low limit, like their legal tolerance for it is weird. But the fact that a company is knowingly selling the product and, and in high amounts and just paying off the fines and then promoting it as a safe and healthy product just to me sits wrong. So um, I've also had people use their non-vegan products, which shouldn't have heavy metals and just say that even their isolates give severe, awful, like cramping, digestion, blow, et cetera. So when it comes to supplements, sourcing is very important. Um, whey has been shown to, depending on the virome of the actual supplement, so where the cow was made, the milk, the virome of that whole processing, um, then you take in and affects our own virome and microbiome. So the source of your supplement is very, very important. So if you're buying from those huge name brands where like you probably can't think of a cow that they have in sight, um, like then you're probably not in the right sourcing uh, panel. So that's interesting. Okay. I, when, when we get off, I'm going to have to have you tell me the name of that supplement company. <laughs> Make sure that I'm yeah. not using that. You at probably all. know it. Like without even knowing it, you probably know it because your clients are coming to you on these supplements and having a lot of distress. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to be on the lookout for that. Um, yeah. What's your take on humans consuming dairy? like cow's milk and stuff. Do you see, totally it, it. yeah, totally fine. So there's so many yeah, there's, there's people are on both fence of it on the both sides. Oh of the yeah, fence. I know. And I just told you all about how I came from the paleo background too. And I'm still here, here I am still consuming. I consume so much dairy in a day. Um, yeah. I have it like three times, three servings probably a day. And um, for me, I think it's a great source of vitamin D, calcium and probiotics, especially when it's sourced from an organic source. Um, and yes, I've also had people come to me being like, well, Dasha, it's not even proven that organic is any better than conventional. And I'm like, okay, well, in my opinion, it, it, for me, I feel better when I, when I buy an organic dairy period. I don't, I don't really good. Me. Point. I mean, there's a lot of things that may point in one direction or the other, but if it comes down to, you said it a couple of times during this, if it feels good to you you know, go for it. I mean, that, I've, I've said the same thing before, as far as like telling clients, there's no good food or bad food. There's just food. If it doesn't digest properly for you, then that's a bad food for you, but it might not be a bad food for me or for you or for the next person, but for you, it is. So a lot of people get confused with allergy, food allergies and food intolerances. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between those? Cause obviously we hear it a lot with like gluten right? Gluten allergy, gluten intolerance. 90% of the population thinks that they have a gluten allergy and then they just avoid it. Um, what, can you talk a little bit about the differences and things with that? Yeah. So a true food allergy is IgE med mediated, IgE. Now the ones that are on the um, supplement market for, in terms of like the gut testing and the food sensitivity testing, um, all of those do not actually test your allergy responses. What they do test is another form of immunoglobulin. And that is actually pretty reactive to any food that you recently ate, right? So you take these basically food sensitivity tests and it shoots out all the foods you've recently eaten. And as a result, you change up your diet completely and then you feel amazing and you're like, wow, I was sensitive to so many foods when in reality, all you did was change your diet and magically feel better, right? You probably just changed one thing that, that ultimately, again, changed your microbiome. Because as I said earlier, everything that you eat will change your microbiome. So you literally changed your microbiome and that ended up helping you, right? So that's why those food sensitivity tests are so dangerous. And a lot of the allergy associations nationally actually recommend against them saying that they are really dangerous because what people end up doing is restricting their diets from all these really yeah. nutrient dense foods. Yeah. yeah. So 
all these nutrient dense foods you're now restricting for no reason. Um, and it can cause a lot of nutrient deficiencies. Oh, absolutely. Now, that's a really good point. Now you talked about earlier in the podcast, you briefly mentioned like the elimination diet and stuff. And, and I think a lot of people would be interested to hear what that entails, what the process is with that. When somebody has comes to you and they have gut issues and stuff and you put them on an elimination diet, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So core perform is the elimination protocol, right? That is what we begin with. And what I did when I created that was I took out all high FODMAP foods, high GERD, histamine, et cetera, foods, so that it was super, super easy to follow and least reactive. Um, a lot of people will start their quote unquote elimination diet and they'll be like, oh, I'm doing low FODMAP. And I'm like, low FODMAP not going to really help for the majority of people because you're not going to be able to identify. It's what I found, at least what I've seen is that it's not necessarily all FODMAPs that people react to. It's specific foods that they might be more inclined to be sensitive to. Um, and again, I bring up that example with the almonds versus almond butter. Like had I just been focusing on FODMAPs or something and I had had her reintroduce it, not in different forms, but in just the type, we would have just said, oh, it's a FODMAP or whatever. Um, now, when it comes to elimination diets, there's a couple of ways that you can go about it, right? You can either, what people tend to do is they're like, oh, I've eliminated gluten and dairy and nothing works, or I've done keto and nothing works. And it's, again, this is what I hear all the time. Um, or they'll say, I tried eliminating gluten and then I switched to dairy. And then I tried eliminating something else. And at that point, you're really just wasting your time and energy. Why I love the core perform protocol and why I created it is it swipes you out baseline clean while fortifying you with all those micronutrient dense foods I talked about to ensure that there's very minimal nutrient deficiencies, if any. Um, again, you're working with me too. So I can see in your daily journal, what foods you're eating and I can quickly pick up to make sure that we're capitalizing on everything. Um, and then we build it out the most, the, and with the most variety. So after we've basically done a baseline sweep with the top allergens, things like soy, corn, dairy, gluten, um, then we go in and we really get to be more specific, right? Whether it be garlic and onion or polyols or some, which would be things like blackberries, mushrooms, um, cauliflower, or is it more like bananas really constipate and bloat you, um, which is another common one. Bananas are known, if you've ever heard of the brat diet, if you ever get sick with diarrhea, food poisoning, the brat diet, so bananas, rice, apples, and toast, those are all binding foods for a lot of people, which means that when consumed in excess, they can cause things to bind up or cause more constipation. So I oftentimes see people who have a lot of bananas or toast in a week, like they'll be like, oh, I'm really constipated. And I'm like, all right, well, let's try switching it up away from those foods. And usually that'll help. Right. So you brought up bloat. Let's talk about bloat for a minute because I inevitably throughout the week, client check-ins probably hear it 10 to 15 times. I was just really bloated this week. Right. Or I was really bloated after a meal. Well, were you bloated or was it just normal distension after a meal? Right. So a lot of people don't know how to differentiate between the two. Like when you eat something, you're, you're not going to be as, as slim and as, as tight as you are the first thing you wake up in the morning. Right. So how does somebody know if it's a bloat issue that they need to address or if it's just normal post-meal distension? Mm -hmm. Honestly, even I don't, I can sometimes feel bloated, but yeah. more than anything, I can visually see and I can feel that I'm puffy. And that's a puffiness that doesn't resolve around, revolve, sorry, around my stomach. Right. Yes, it doesn't include my stomach, but it is my entire body just feels a little bit swollen. That would be more of a bloat reaction, right? Okay. Because it's not, it, it's, you're holding water. Um, like, right. Yeah. Um, and and yes, it can be isolated and geared around your stomach a lot of times, but oftentimes that would be associated more with distension, whereas that's painful, like you cannot suck in because it is just painfully distended. Okay. Um, that is one of the symptoms, by the way, I see with a lot of this first 
with a lot of this uh, supplement company <laughs> that I, that I hear of. Um, but just to, it's just to be still- clear, that was one of the top three I was thinking that you were talking about. <laughs> I don't know if you can block that out, but um, it's it, it's the one that it's, I just, again, from my experience, people tell me that it causes that painful bloat where it's like a rock, their stomach is a rock. Yeah. Um, that is the, is, that is distension, right? That is not bloat. That is directly after your meal. Bloat, I typically see, again, like you'll wake up bloated or you'll wake up like holding that systemic water um, versus like directly after a meal, I'm bloated. It's like maybe you're bloated, but it's probably more along the lines of distended. Like you just ate and you're having some indigestion. Yeah. Um, You know, I know I know it's going to depend on the meal, of course, and everything and the contents of it. What's a normal digestion time post meal for people like if they are feeling this bit of distension right a couple hours and they should hopefully probably start feeling a little bit better or is that not anything that you can even talk on no that's a great question and i'm only laughing because it's so dependent on what you just say and the person and the digestive capacity and their gi motility rates and what is going on like How um but what I, stuff like that right. Yeah. What I will say is that like, if you're really bloated, it'll probably go away within like 15, 30 minutes, right? After you finish eating um, the pain, at least pain wise, it could be an hour up to an hour and a half. After that time, you should start to already feel a little bit better once your digestion actually starts kicking in and you're yeah. digesting the food. Now, when you originally asked the question, what I thought you were asking is how long does it take to digest food? And that can be quite long, right? Like if I were to have a nice T-bone steak, that might be in my system for a solid 48 hours, right? Like that's a lot to digest. Um, Protein is very difficult to digest. um, And so are fats. So that would take a little bit longer to digest versus again, y'all know like something like glycofuse where I have like an intercarb that's gonna digest really quick. Um, that might still actually cause bloat by the way, for some people, um, I've again, by the way, my um, core perform deals with gut health and athletes. So almost all of these people that I've worked with all work out, all do some sort of training, whether it be bodybuilding, running marathons, CrossFit, et cetera. So, um, I'm familiar with how supplements deal in the body and how they digest in the body. And glycofuse is a great intracarb, that highly cyclic dextrin. But a lot of times, even the highly cyclic dextrins, when they sweeten it, because it's pea starch based, um, at least glycofuse is, um, they try and mask it with the um, sweeteners. And that can cause some GI distress too, just because of the osmolality too, of how quickly that is absorbed. And um, if you guys know what osmosis is, if you remember back to like high school biology, um, it's just like the swelling. and (laughs) Yeah, it's just like the swelling and the movement of water through the cells and everything. So that can also affect how your gut. So you you just mentioned that obviously you work a lot with athletes and improving athletic performance and gut health and stuff, which I would imagine that a good majority of people that are listening to this podcast, um, because if they follow me, they know I'm into bodybuilding and athletics and stuff like that as well. So let's talk about that. Let's go to that realm a little bit. How, I'm trying to think of how to ask answer, ask this, because obviously most things are going to be client dependent, individually dependent. What are some generalizations, some general overall points and tips that you can give people that are looking to optimize their gut health to optimize their performance? For anything, when you're trying to optimize your gut health, start journaling, start journaling the foods, the symptoms, start journaling the time, see if you can start putting them together. Most likely it's very difficult to do on your own. Even if I were to start doing my own ones, just like when you're in prep and you need a coach to have a second eye and be like, Dasha, why are you thinking of this? Like, this is the same exact thing. People come to me all the time. They're like, oh, like looking at my journal, like I can see that I probably reacted to like X, Y, Z. And I'm like, no, like that's absolutely not what's going on at all. Like, please don't go down that route. Um, So when it comes to getting a starting place with your 
um, pre-workout and post-workout nutrition specifically, um, as well as just um, game day strategies. Um, you really want to start journaling um, most effective practices. And I also want to really encourage you and, and support the idea that you should test different meal types, frequencies, and um, specifics, if that makes sense, like volume and everything like that. Because most people, again, they'll come to me and they're like, I train fasted. That's what feels right to me. I'm like, nope, we're changing that. There's no reason for you to be fasting during your workout. That is not optimal. I know by research, it is not optimal. And your gut will, uh, it will adjust to anything. I tell you anything for a week, it'll be uncomfortable. And then it'll adjust. just like the same way opposite. If you are starving first thing in the morning and I'm like, nope, we're going to do fasted workouts your body would adjust. After a week, it would know not to be starving at that point. You would get used to it. That's just how our bodies work. They adapt. So whatever you are doing now may feel optimal, but it is not necessarily optimal, right? It is just comfortable for your body right now because you have not pushed it to new um, experimentation. So if you've always done really low fat, high carb pre-workout meals, fuck it. Try high protein, high fat, like see what happens and see if you can have even better workout. If you wait an hour or two, instead of going 15 minutes before, you know, like yeah. really testing those out and finding what works for you is so important. I've got a guy on prep right now and he's, he's about seven weeks in, he's got about another 10 weeks or so to go. And, uh, he's doing great and everything. But he's like, I'm, having a real hard time getting through my workouts now and he's still on pretty decent calories but I it's like what are you eating before you go to work out right I was like first of all you are eating right before you go to work out <laughs> and he's like yeah I'm eating and he's like I'm having a, a piece of toast with some guacamole on it some pineapple and a little bit of cottage cheese I'm like dude that thing is going like right through you you got to get a little bit more substance we need to get a little bit more fat in you before that we need to get a little bit heartier like maybe some oatmeal something a little bit heartier that's going to stick with you so he's going to try that but but you bring up a good point like there's certain things are going to work for certain people i know a lot of people even though it's not optimal like you and i both agree to go train fasted they do it and they're fine right they can mm -hmm. push through it they're fine um I know other people that, you know, they can eat a whole damn pizza and go train and they're fine. And there's some people that are like kind of right there in the middle. They, they have to experiment for yourself to see, um, like you said, like size of meal, uh, the contents of the meal, the frequency of the meal, things like that. Timing is all going to be really, really important. Um, I came across uh, one of your posts that I wanted you to talk about real quick because um, I think it's it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty easy, but I think it's really important for people to understand the five pillars of gut health. Do you remember totally. the so, you did? Yeah, of course. I, I preach my five pillars. Are you kidding me? You I go. know like the back you, of my hand. Talk a little bit about that and, because I, a few of them, obviously I'm looking on here and it's, they're very straightforward, but I think a lot of people might not think of it as this easy, right? Like to, to really just narrow it down to these five areas and how this can really affect your gut health. So Preach on. All righty. Well, I do this and I get on this pedestal with all my clients anyway. So it's no news to me. Um, I, the five gut health pillars are what I like to call speed. By getting to the speeds, you're speeding up your metabolism, right? We're going to speed up our metabolism. It's a really easy way to think about it. Um, so the first one is sleep. Sleep, then it goes personal stress for the P, environmental stress for the E, exercise for the second E and diet for the fifth. And notice that sleep is number one. And that is for a reason. <laughs> diet and exercise come last. <laughs> when it comes to gut health, like you need to make sure you are sleeping well. You need to make sure that your stress in your life is quite low. You're addressing your mental health. That's why we got um, a team counselor on board. And I kid you not, every single person gets 30 minutes free session, which is awesome. And every single one after that was like, sign me up full time with this guy. Like I have never been able to feel so heard. Yeah. And that's so important when it comes to gut health. Like you need to understand the core of who you are, why you're doing the behaviors you are, because you're not going to change those behaviors unless you get to the root of who you are as a human being. So yeah. that's why yeah. I did personal I stress. Book on that last year, just in another area, not as far as like gut health and stuff, but therapy is so huge. You have to have somebody that can identify because listen, we're, we have this amazing ability as humans to 
believe anything, good or bad, right? So we're going to make ourselves believe we're not as stressed as we are or that we're more stressed than we should be, right? And that is all going to affect everything because everything starts up here. And it's just, I'm glad that you do this. I'm glad. I like this SPEED acronym. That's yeah, easy yeah. to remember. Um, and you hit on every single important aspect. So obviously the sleep. So how does your lack of sleep mess with your gut microbiome and, and that whole gut health thing? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of hormonal changes that'll go on as well as disrupting your circadian rhythm. A lot of people don't know, I think, at least I hope that they are starting to know, at least now you will. Um, your metabolism is best, your carb metabolism is best in the morning. So big breakfast is the way to go. Breakfast like a king and then dinner should be light. Um, and that is because it is that's how our circadian rhythm is built. Um, and we've been see, showing in metabolism studies um, that that is what is best for our bodies. Um, we're more insulin sensitive in the morning um, and thus that will help to aid in those uh, cortisol regulation and the hormonal regulation. So um, I bring up cortisol, which is gonna be huge for all of these things. Um, basically all of these different five speed pillars can affect your cortisol levels. Now cortisol, um, is a hormone released by the adrenal glands. Um, and it basically tells your body whether it's in fight or flight response um, versus a parasympathetic state that rest and digest. So when you're in that fight or flight response, your cortisol is high, your blood sugar is high, and your body is actually catabolic. So it will be breaking down muscle um, instead of fat for stores. So a lot of people, when you're you're like, oh, I'm burning, burning calories, whatever, like, um, sure, but where are those calories being sourced from? When you're in a high cortisol state, that's coming from your muscles. It's not coming from your fat. Um, yes, some of it's coming from your fat, but a lot of it's coming also from your muscle. And that's not good for anyone who's, who's trying to lose weight, right? So you're trying to lose weight and you have high cortisol. Basically what you're doing is you're adding more fat and you're taking away your muscle. <laughs> so a big note, right. And slowing down your metabolism. That's why all coaches nowadays know to preach um, never to go that low, always to um, regulate your hormones with refeeds on the weekends or during the weekdays, however you want to do it. Um, but that hormone regulation is so, so important um, for that cortisol. And all of these factors in speed will affect your cortisol levels. So if you're not resting and if you're not um, allowing your body in, during the nighttime to have that immune response to kind of rebuild and um, cycle off all the dead cytotoxins and everything in your body, um, then you're, you're higher stress, right? And you're under more stress because there's more inflammation in the body and, and that's gonna cause more permeability and more disruption and more of that fat gain and less of that muscle gain. <laughs> more of what you don't want and less of what you do want, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I've kind of used this analogy before that like our body, our body is like a, a, a glass of stress, all right? So it doesn't matter if you, you're pouring in stress from exercise or your personal life or a lack of sleep or anything, it's eventually gonna get up to the brim. And it doesn't matter what makes it all start overflowing. It could be somebody in traffic that cuts you off, right? Once that starts overflowing, it's gonna affect every part of your life, your, your rest and recovery, your work, your relationship, your gym time, everything. So stress is, that's something that, a lot of my clients, if they're listening to this, they're probably laughing right now because I preach that so much. Like, how was your- I use the bucket analogy, but it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, no, that's, I, I love this analogy. I think that's a great, if, if you guys aren't following her, what's your, what's your Instagram name? I'm going to put everything in the description, but why don't you go ahead and- It's really easy. Dasha Fitness, D-A-S-H-A -S Fitness. Yeah. So all her information is going to be in the description below, but I mean, she's got tons of great posts. This one in particular, I think could help a lot of people. If you just, it's a very simple analogy, right? Or a simple acronym, I should say. And it just really breaks down everything. I think I even made a guide for that one. So there's literally 50 ways to change your gut health using the speed pillars. If you just go to my guide. So it's yeah. a good way, good little night read for tonight. <laughs> yep, you guys go check it out. Well, we're, we're kind of coming up in time. I don't want to keep you too much longer. I just want to thank you so much. I mean, listen, some of this stuff, uh, you know, I didn't even know. I mean, like I said, I'm, I, I bring, one of the things I want to do with this podcast was I selfishly wanted to bring people on that I could personally <laughs> learn from. Um, 
not just the people that are listening to this, but I think people are going to get a lot out of this podcast. I'd love to have you back on another time and talking about another topic and everything, but um, why don't you, uh, so they can find you at obviously Dasha Fitness. Um, what's your website? You have a website too? Yeah, it's fitwithdasha.com and that has all about like the core perform protocol and um, in a week I have a new launch coming. Uh, so we'll be offering like a smaller tiered kind of pro coaching as well. Um, so that'll be exciting. So fitwithdasha.com. It has a bunch of free resources too, like recipe books that are core perform approved. Um, a lot of free stuff on there. Um, fitwithdasha.com, then at Dasha Fitness for my IG, where I post stories and do a lot of engagement. So I'll see you guys there. And guys, I'm gonna like I said, I'm gonna put that all in the description below. If you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, it'll be in there. If you're watching on YouTube, it'll be in the description box. But Listen, thank you so much. This has been great. Um, we'll definitely do this again soon. And I hope all you guys listening, uh, I hope you understand how lucky you are. You just got a wealth of knowledge there in about 45, 50 minutes. So uh, Dasha, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for having me. And now that I actually said free resources on my website, I realized that I have like a 50 page gut friendly ebook about, um, with all recipes. So I'm going to give you the link to that. So any of your subscribers, if they just put in their emails, they'll get it directly sent to them. So if you guys want that for free, check the link down below and we'll get you hooked up with that. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you so much, guys. Um, I'll be back with another episode soon. Thank you guys for tuning in. Remember, subscribe, share, do the rating thing. All that stuff helps tremendously. But uh, thanks again, Dasha. Thanks for having me.